Hi, and welcome everyone. We're glad to have you join us. Um, as everyone comes in, please just type in the chat box. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where you're viewing from and what do you teach? Who are your students? Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're very happy uh, to welcome all of you. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we are very happy to be here. Um, my name is Lottie Baker. I am a regional English language officer or a RELO, and I lead the RELO team in Kyiv, Ukraine. And we work not only with Ukrainian teachers and learners, but also with teachers from Moldova and Hungary and Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. So I'm very happy um, to see some of our teachers here. Uh, and I'm here today with my RELO colleagues in Europe. So Jennifer Euler and Micah Rischer. So Jennifer, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this great event with our specialist, Dan Shepard. My name is Jennifer Euler, and I'm the Regional English Language Officer working with teachers um, in Poland, Belarus, Greenland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Russia. I welcome all of you and hope you'll find a lot of good learning in tonight's webinar. Back to you, Lottie. Thanks, Jen. And Micah, you want to get on and say hello to your teachers? Hello, everybody. Greetings from Belgrade, Serbia. I've just arrived a month ago. Happy to be here. And I have the privilege of working with teachers in Albania, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Croatia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Romania, here in Serbia, of course, Slovakia and Slovenia, and happy to learn with the rest of you from Dan. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Micah. So we're going to get started with our specialist, Dr. Dan Shepard, in just a moment. Uh, but first, I want to remind you a bit about the format. So some of you may have joined us last May and June for our first series on this topic. Uh, now that school is beginning again, we thought we would return with a different specialist, uh, Dan, who um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Dan in a moment. Um, he's going to lead us through some ideas and strategies about trauma-informed teaching. He'll sometimes ask uh, for audience reflection and participation. So please, please um, add your thoughts in the chat box when he does. Um, and then when you do, just remember that this is a safe space. So we encourage you to interact with others via the chat, but keep in mind that you know, we're all learners in this topic. Um, and this is a hard topic, it's a hard conversation. And so we wanna build each, other's up, each other up. Uh, so just keep that in mind in your comments. Um, the second reminder is that this webinar is being recorded. Um, we'll upload it to our social media pages afterwards. Uh, so if you miss something or if you want to share it with a colleague, you can do that. Uh, but after this webinar, so this webinar will be from six to seven or from about an hour, uh, roughly. And then after the webinar, you are all invited to join us in a private, unrecorded Zoom conversation. So this conversation will be informal. Um, it will be a place for you to share about your experiences. It'll be a place for you to talk with Dan, um, with us. Um, to, to get some ideas maybe. So we really welcome you to be a part of that second, that second unrecorded informal part. Um, and as a reminder, that's not going to be um, uploaded on social media, that second conversation. So at the end of the webinar, we will give you a new Zoom link to go into this, uh, to the conversation. So stay till the end of the webinar and then be on the lookout for a new Zoom link. And you'll have to click on that link to enter the, the chat room or the, the Zoom room to have this conversation. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I wanna tell you a little bit about our EL English language specialist, uh, Dan Shepard. So Dan Shepard, he is a lifelong educator. He has more than 30 years of experience. Uh, Dan is taught in high school. Um, he's taught high school English for about a decade and then he became a school leader. He was a principal at both the elementary and the secondary levels, um, and then he was a system superintendent in different school districts. Uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Shepard has been a college professor where he teaches new teachers and teacher leaders, 
Uh, in addition to teaching, uh, Dr. Shepard is, he's uh, published, um, published books, and he is a well-received presenter. So we'll get to benefit from that today. Um, one of Dan's books is a handbook about teaching students who have experienced trauma. So after this webinar, you might want to look that up. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dan. Well, Adi, I can't thank you enough for that uh, wonderful introduction. I can't thank you enough for this wonderful opportunity. I thank you and, of course, your other partners, uh, Micah and Jennifer and others. I'm just so very, very grateful to have an opportunity to speak to teachers. I've worked with teachers my whole life, and I just love teachers. I'm crazy about teachers. I'll do anything to help a teacher. And so today, I'm incredibly hopeful that something wonderful will happen that will be of benefit to teachers. In fact, that's the very first thing I wanted to say to you. Take a look at that slide in front of you. Notice that the word you is large and bold-faced. This session is all about you, teacher. This session is all about what we can do to help you help your students. And I've got great news for you. I know that you've been through some difficult times in recent months, perhaps in recent years, but I know that in the next hour, we're going to say something that will be beneficial for you. We're going to say something that will be applicable to you. We're going to say something that I hope is even inspirational for you. The difficulties that you've been facing, the challenges that you've been facing, those are real. No one would ever say that they're not, but I'm here to tell you that there are helpful mechanisms to guide you even through the most difficult circumstances. So my first comment to you today is that something good is about to happen in your life. Something helpful is about to occur. Are you ready? I am, and I'm super excited. The first thing though, my friends there that uh, the RELOs have asked me to give you a brief introduction to me more as a human being. Since we'll be interacting together for the next hour, I think they wanted you to know I was a person and not just a talking head. So I'm just going to let you know, you can see a large map of the United States there, and my home is right under that yellow star. I live smack dab in the middle of, middle of America, uh, a little town by the name, well, little, a big city by the name of Kansas City is my home, and uh, that's where I'm speaking from right now, even today. I am a college professor. This is an aerial photograph of my university, Missouri Western State. Wow, I love my job, love my students, love my university, and I'm so glad to share it with you today. I thought you might be interested in just an ordinary average American home. Uh, mine is very much that, uh, but that's the house I live in, not far from Kansas City. You might be curious to know that I'm a parent. I do have six children. Now, sadly, this photo is about 15 years old. Uh, those children are all adults now, and they look very, very different. Uh, but those are my wonderful kids. I'm crazy about all of them. And of course, it all starts with my wife. She makes it go. Uh, that's her. I'm assuming you can tell one is her, one is me. And uh, we were at a science conference a couple of years ago and uh, took that uh, fun photo. But uh, she is really uh, the great joy of my life and really keeps the wheels on the car. Well, having said all of that, let's go ahead and talk about what we want to accomplish today. You know, if you're ever going to go anywhere meaningful, if you're ever going to accomplish anything worthwhile, you need to know where you're going. You need to have a vision of what it is that you want to accomplish. Well, today we have three clear tasks that I want to give to you. We have three clear areas of understanding where I really want to try and reach out and implement something meaningful in your life. Item number one, we're going to give you just a very basic, brief foundation to what trauma-informed instruction is and looks like from a research-based perspective. Now, I know that we've got a large group of people listening today. Some of you know a lot. Some of you know a little. We're just going to try and even the playing field for everyone. We're going to try and have a shared foundation that we can work from moving forward. So the first part of our presentation, it'll take 7, 10, 12 minutes. The first part of our presentation is just establishing a foundation for what trauma-informed instruction is, what it looks like, and how it operates in the classroom. Number two, you are probably aware that trauma, just like everything else in life, impacts different individuals differently. 
We know from research what some of those core trends are, and we'll very briefly talk about those. So when you look out over your classroom of students, all of them sharing similar trauma perhaps, but all responding to it differently. Just as you differentiate your instruction trying to meet the needs of individual students, you should also differentiate your response when it comes to areas of trauma. The middle part of our presentation today will focus on that. And then finally, the last thing that we'll talk about, which I think might be the most important of all, which is probably why it's last, is the idea of developing resilience. We know so much more today than we did even five or 10 years ago about how to make kids stronger, how to help them learn to get up when they've been knocked down. I'm so excited to share with you some of the tickets to rapid student resilience That'll be the last part of our presentation today. Well, I've already said too much, it's much more important to get your interaction and your involvement. I'm gonna take a brief pause in my own speaking now, and I'm gonna let Lati step in and guide you through this question. Of the topics that we'll be talking about today, which one do you really need? Which one is the most important for you? Which one do you really want to experience some significant growth in? We'll spend a few minutes talking about that even now. Lottie? That's a great way to start, Dan. So of those three topics that you mentioned, foundation, individualization, or resilience, which one of those topics do you think you need the most information about? Which do you need to most to maximize the benefits for your students? So foundation, individualization, or resilience? So we'll talk about each of these throughout this webinar, but go ahead and do some thinking now about which one you might want to learn the most about. So I see, yeah, I see some people typing in the chat box. I see individualization, resilience, resilience for me. Yes, I hear that word a lot lately, resi resilience. And how can we foster that in our kids and our students that we teach and in ourselves too sometimes. Um, resilience, resilience. And individualization, I see individualization. I think it's that's a very important one too because we know our students are so different and they respond differently. Um, they have different uh, experiences and different responses. And oh, and I see foundation, some foundation. Yeah, I think that's an important one to start with, foundation. So good, Dan, it looks like that there's a good, a good mix. I think our audience wants to know a little bit about each of these. Well, outstanding. Thank you so much, Lottie, for your help with that. Friends, uh, I sense, listening to the comments that I heard from Lottie, that we want to try and spend some time with resilience today. Of course, they're all important, but it sounds like that's where we want to go. We're going to get there. So you hang on, uh, you be patient, and I promise you that we're going to have some wonderful advice for you related to student resilience. But on our way there, let's make sure that we have a shared foundation. Let's make sure that we all understand the very basics of trauma-informed instruction. You know, it all starts with this idea of safety. That is number one. I'm so glad I'm starting here because it's the most important thing for you to remember. My wonderful friends, I know you're far away. I know that we're not talking in person, but if there were some way that I could really convince you of something, it would be of this, that students who are feeling unsafe in a learning environment simply cannot function well. There's all kinds of turmoil, chaos, and trauma outside the classroom. But in the classroom, job one for you, if you're going to create a trauma-sensitive classroom, is to make sure that that classroom is a thousand percent a safe place. Now, if I just said that to you and I didn't give you any recommendations for how you might make that occur, I don't know that I've done you much good. Let me give you just one quick example today. Many years ago, when I was a high school English teacher, I had a student in my classroom that was significantly overweight. He may have been 300 pounds. Sadly, I don't know what that is in kilograms, but he was a large, large young man. And sometimes, as happens, when you're a big kid, you take a lot of abuse. And I remember one day I was standing in the hallway monitoring students and my student came walking down and three or four students were around him in a circle, insulting him, picking on him, bullying him about his weight. And I remember stepping into the middle of the hallway and I said, you guys are going to stop that and you're going to stop that now. This is not the way that we treat each other in this school. 
The three boys walked on their way, but the large student stood there for a moment looking at me. You know what? True story, friends. His learning dramatically turned around in my classroom. The moment that he knew that he had an advocate, the moment that he knew that he had a friend, the moment that he knew that I was going to foster safety for him, his learning dramatically improved. Wonderful friends, I encourage you, what are you doing to insist upon a perfectly safe environment in your classroom? Hey, I know, I get it, I understand. Things outside your classroom are tough, they're traumatic, they're chaotic. But within that zone of learning, there must be peace, there must be security, there must be safety. And I know you can make tremendous change in that area. Here's our second discussion question for you now. And wow, I'd love to hear from dozens of you about this so we can share the wealth of knowledge that you already possess. What can you tell us about what you're doing to create a safe space in your classroom that dozens of other teachers would benefit from knowing? Lottie, would you help us? Yeah, what do you think? How are you making your classroom a safe space for all students? So what are some things that you can do or that you do right now in your classroom environment to make sure it's safe and students feel safe? I know some of you might be teaching online right now, so you could think about what that looks like online. Some of you are teaching uh, in person and in a more traditional classroom. Uh, so think about it. What is it that you can do or that you're doing to make sure all of your students feel safe um, and feel ready to learn? Uh, so what, what are some things that you can do? Uh, you might think about uh, your classroom environment, like maybe the way, um, you know, signs that you put in your classroom. You might think about the ways you interact with, uh, with your students, um, maybe talking with them individually. Um, think about, I see someone is saying that they, um, they make a comfortable place for students with pillows. So maybe you think about how to make the environment um, more nurturing. So maybe make it look like a, a, a comfortable place rather than you know, an office or a, a traditional classroom. Um, oh yeah, I see someone says, this is a great idea. We greet each other with high fives or a handshake every day. That's a great, I like those routines. I think that's really helpful. It really sets the tone if you begin the day with a compliment or a high five. Um, yeah, and I like that someone mentioned that they, when someone has a problem, they speak to them in person, right? And privately, that's great. Using students' names. I think that goes a long way. It really shows that you care. Um, and even just smiling. Yeah, so the simple things like that can really, uh, I think they can really go, go, um, go a long way. So thanks, Dan. Well, Lottie, I can't thank you enough. Friends, the first brick in building this foundation of trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive learning, that first brick, the most important brick, is the issue of safety. And wow, you came up with some amazing ideas to do that well. If you're not doing some of those, Tomorrow is a great day for you to start doing so. First brick, safety. Second brick, we're going to talk about this issue of choice. Now, this might seem counterintuitive to you because I know as a parent, when our child is struggling, we want to rally around and give them all kinds of support. And sometimes this, this support can be very restrictive. The research tells us, though, that when we have lost all control through trauma, then we want to try and regrow that control by giving choice, by giving students options. Now, let me give you another quick example of what you could do in class to increase the amount of choice. If you're in a, a writing class, obviously you must do writing. But if you're in a history class, just as an example, it may be that the traumatized student isn't emotionally, intellectually, cognitively ready to do heavy writing on a paper but he might be able to do significant, meaningful discussion with his peers about the same topic. If your goal for that student was to interact in a verbal way with the content, whether it's writing or whether it's speaking in a history class may not always make significant difference. And so the trauma sensitive teacher knows what the child is ready to do in a given moment and allows the child to make choices still consistent with the necessary learning, but choices that are appropriate 
related to where he is emotionally. Friends, as we always do, we'll take a brief pause. I've given you one example. We'd love to hear dozens more. What are the kinds of things that you're doing to enable your students to have greater choice in your learning environment? What are those things that you do that let them take a little bit of control back in their life? Lottie? Yeah, that's a great point. What do you do? What can you do to give your students choice? So what are some things that you can do? You can write it in the chat box or in the comments in Facebook so we can see. So think about maybe small ways that you can give your students choice, maybe in the kind of assignments they complete. Um, what are some ways that, or maybe the kind of, uh, for instance, I remember when I was a teacher, I would give students choices in the kind of books they would read, the topics of books. Um, oh, I see someone says that they, let them choose a daily song for a warm up. Warm ups, that's a great way to give them choice, right? In the, in the warm up sessions, um, students can choose, oh, this is a good idea, choose their pairs or groups. So sometimes we might wanna strategically match our students with certain partners, but sometimes it's good to give them a choice to choose who they work with. Um, allow them to write in their books, oh, with pens of any color they want. I like that idea. That's such a simple, a simple choice, but it can mean a lot. And then I think the student, they feel more ownership over their writing if they get to choose the kind of pen they use or the color they use. Um, that's a great idea. Uh, anything? Yes, we provide cho choice and homework. Oh, that's a good idea. So maybe the kind of task that they do. So sometimes we have the same learning goal, but there are different ways we can get there, right? And so you can give students choice in the kind of task they, they do uh, for home, for, for their work at home. And that's also good because our students' home environments, they may be different. So they may have different resources at home or different kinds of spaces where they work. So these are great ideas. They're very inspiring for me. So Dan, over to you. Can you tell us a little bit more? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lottie. And again, my thanks to those in attendance. You guys are doing great today. Uh, it is the nature of teachers to give grades, and I give you all A+. Plus. Fantastic work thus far today. So we're still building that foundation. That first brick is safety. That second brick is choice. That third brick is collaboration. Now, I want to say this the right way, and I know you're all going to immediately disagree. Everybody's pain is private, but everybody's healing occurs in a group. We only get better when we're surrounded by love. We only resume our non-traumatic lifestyle when those around us assist us in the process of doing so. Friends, I can't stress to you enough the importance of community, the importance of collaboration the importance of togetherness, the importance of unity. Think about your classroom right now. If I walked into it tomorrow, what would be the dominant, dominant emotion that I would sense? You know, I've been in classrooms before where you can just feel the love. It's palpable. The teacher cares so desperately for her students, they know it. The students care desperately for each other, they feel it. What's the dominant emotion in your classroom? You know how I create the right kind of feeling in my own classroom? Every day, even though I'm a college professor and I work with 20 year olds and older, every day I open every class with community time. And I pose the same question, what's making you feel good today? What's making you feel bad today? And we don't spend a lot of time with it. You might say, I don't have time for that. I've got so much teaching that I need to do. Friends, I'm only asking for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, where the students know you're a human being that cares about them, and it gives them an opportunity to interact with each other so that they know they're in a collaborative community of warmth and of learning. You know, when I ask my students this question, it's always amazing to me the kinds of responses that I get. Uh, I find out that someone has a new puppy. I find out that someone has joined the army. I find out that someone was cut from the volleyball team. I find out someone has a new car, a new job, a new boss that's frustrating. All of that information is helpful for me as a teacher. Then as I go about the process of instructing them, I can teach them better when I know them better. 
But that's not really our point today, is it? Our point today is how do we help students heal from trauma? And again, I reemphasize with you as strongly as I can, all the best healing occurs in a group. Friends, I know that you all do this and I know that you do a fantastic job of it. What are the things that you're currently doing in your classroom to foster a greater sense of community, collaboration, togetherness, love, and warmth? Yeah, that's a great question. So how are you creating and improving your classroom sense of connection and community? That's great. Sometimes we get so focused on learning goals, we forget that our classroom, we, it's a community. It's a group of students who we want them to support each other. Yeah, I see that people say, oh, they smile a lot. They ask about um, family members, siblings, parents, grandparents. I think a lot of these are great foundations for helping meet these learning goals that we have because if students are comfortable with each other and if they care about each other, then it's easier for them to take risks and to, uh, to collaborate with each other. Yeah, I see that, um, yeah, we set, uh, set pairs or small, small group work. Yes, because sometimes I think in small groups, students are more eager, they're more uh, comfortable to share it with each other. Um, sharing with pairs before the full class. Oh, that's one of my favorites, the think pair share, where students have an opportunity to practice and to share with a small group or with just one person before sharing in a larger group. Um, and even telling a joke, right? Like lighten the mood. I think that's helpful, right? Yes, that's great. Oh, I see lots of ideas here. Yeah, working as a team. Um, yeah, students, oh, students greeting each other and greeting the teachers at the beginning of the, of the class. Um, that's great. Or even being a model, sharing about your own home life, maybe a pet that you have or something about your house or your morning. That's a great way to, to be more human, I think, for students. So these are some great ideas, Dan. Uh, those really are fantastic ideas. Lottie, thank you so much. And thanks to the students that are responding. Uh, you guys are doing an amazing job today helping one another practically. What could be more beautiful than that? All right, friends, we're building that foundation of trauma-informed instruction. We've talked about the first and most important need, a sense of security, a sense of safety. We've talked about giving students greater choice. They've lost all freedom because the trauma is clamping them down. We've got to enable them to have a sense that they're in control of their own lives again by giving them greater choice in the classroom. The third brick as we build this wall, this foundation of trauma-informed learning, the third brick was that sense of community collaboration. We're just gonna do one more before we move to our second point today. And this one, right away, you're all going to say, you're absolutely right. Friends, we wanna talk about trust. If you think about the relationships in your life, whether those relationships be romantic or whether they just be friendly relationships, there's no such thing as a relationship that doesn't have a core foundation of trust. Once trust is gone, there can be no foundation until that trust is restored and repaired. You know what trauma does to students? One of the first things that it does is it takes away their ability to trust others. A lot of times when we experience trauma, we learn that we just can't count on the people that were most important in our lives. You know, I mentioned to you before, I work with 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, and even these students, if their dad left the home when they were six, left the home when they were eight, even 19 years later, they still have difficulty forming relationships because the person that was most important in their life, one of them, mom and dad, one of those individuals proved himself to be untrustworthy and left the scene. And now there's this gaping hole, this gaping wound, this trauma that prevents them from interacting well with others. Trust is so incredibly important. Your students must believe in you. Now, they might not believe in anybody else. They might not believe in their government. They might not believe in their family but they've got to believe in you. Friends, I just wanna give you one quick way to do that. By the way, this sounds so simple, but I can tell you from experience, it is so absolutely true. Be very careful about providing for your students a very consistent understanding of what's going to happen, 
how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. You know, I was shocked when my children were very small. You saw a picture of them. When they were very small, they liked to listen to the same song over and over and over again. This consistency gave them stability. This consistency gave them security. Consistent scheduling is one small way that you can increase trust with your students. What are some other ways that you know? Friends, what do you do to help grow that all important trust with students that have experienced trauma? Lottie, what do we know? Yes, what do you think? How are you improving trust, relational trust? So trust between each other, between yourself and the students, between students and each other. How are you improving that trust with and among your students? So think about some things that you might do and type them in the chat box um, or in the comments if you're on Facebook. So what do you do? So I do see some people writing about groups again, right? So groups seems like this is a good, a good uh, technique to use. So by creating groups in a classroom, it also makes sense outside. So maybe they learn together in the classroom and then they can also become friends with their classmates. Um, being fair and consistent. I think we have to try hard to do that, to remember to be consistent um, because our students notice those things. Giving clear instructions so they're, they're very, um, so students know exactly what we expect of them. Um, asking, asking about students, um, maybe calling them if, they, if they're missing um, to make sure that they're okay, to check up with them if they're, if they're feeling uh, sick or ill. So those are some, those are some great ideas that I see. Um, yeah, I think we have we have a group of teacher experts, I think, in this in this Zoom room or in our Facebook uh, Facebook group. Dan, All right. over to you. Well, yeah, yes. Thank you so much, Lottie. Um, wow, friends, I'm kind of busy right now making sure that I'm presenting information that's beneficial for you. But I might go back and watch this just to write down these ideas. They are truly amazing. You know, at the very beginning, I said to you something good was going to happen today, something beneficial, something practical, something helpful. I hope you're listening to your peers all over Europe as they share with the, you these amazing ideas. Maybe you've jotted a couple down. If you haven't, uh, you know, I encourage you to do so. Uh, these are all very practical, very helpful, very worthwhile. I'm afraid as I look at the clock, we're going to skip this next point, and we're going to go ahead and move into our second main point of the presentation. So our first main point, build a foundation. Build that foundation with trust, with collaboration, with choice, and with safety. Build that foundation. Now we're going to talk about how trauma impacts individuals differently. You know, you'll see there on the screen that I just have an internet image of a giant thumb print. Mine is different than yours. Yours is different than Lottie's. Everybody's thumbprint is different from everybody else's. There are no two thumbprints the same. There are no two people that are the same. When trauma impacts a student's life, research tells us that there are three primary ways that students will respond. The first way will make perfect sense to you. When students experience trauma, many of them just go inside themselves and become trapped in a dark internal place of depression. The sun is never shining. It's always raining. It's always difficult. And they live with this cloud over their head day after day after day. The trauma has forced them inside, internally. Some students don't express this internalization with depression. They express it with anxiety. Trauma has happened once. Who's to say that it won't happen again and again and again? And they begin to worry about everything. Their mind can never be calm because anxious thoughts are always swirling. You know, my wonderful friends, we could spend hours and hours just talking about this, and I wish that we had the time to do so. But let's just focus on one quick solution. You know, in my own life, wrong place, in my own life, when I am experiencing difficulty, I find it hard to get started with the first step. Uh, because I'm thinking about 15 things at once, just getting started 
can be the hardest thing for me. Can you imagine what it must be like for an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old? Their mind is constantly swirling or they're stuck in this deep, dark depression. They just don't know what to do. You know what happens then? That's when you intervene. That's when you step in. Now, I should just say this. Good teachers know when their students are struggling. There's a million ways for you to do that. I won't go into all of them now, but you should be observing your students. Do you know when they've gone inside themselves in a harmful way because of trauma? Are you observant enough to recognize that? Are you relational enough to notice that there's been a change in their personality? That's got to be the first step. But once you've done that, then what can you do? Well, the research tells us it's very clear that when students are anxious and their mind is swirling, they don't need to know everything. They just need to know the next thing. And so when you're working with students and you give them a major assignment and it has six parts, most of your students are going to write down what those six parts are and they're going to start working their way through. But for your child of depression, your child of anxiety, you might walk directly to him, put a hand on his shoulder and say, hey, here's the only thing you need to worry about for the next three minutes. All you've got to do is this. Can you do that? Can you do that for me? Can you start with just step one? You don't need to think about 15 other things right now. In this moment, you just need to think about one. And so when we work with the student that is depressed or anxious, the big task is clarity and organization. Well, I've given you one amazing idea. I can say it's amazing because it's not my own. It's from the research. What are your amazing ideas? What have you done that really had a tremendously positive impact on the student who internalizes the trauma that he or she has experienced? Lottie? Yeah, that's great. So what are you doing that's successful? What is working for you and working with students who may be depressed or anxious? And so I think you had a great point, Dan. The first step is that you have to know your students so you can recognize when they're acting differently than they usually would, when they are acting depressed or anxious. And then how can you help them? Um, so yeah, so one person says, yeah, you can focus on the task at hand, one thing at a time, kind of like what you were saying, Dan, right? Just focus on the next step. Instead of thinking of steps four, five, six, seven, eight, just focus on the next step, right? The teacher should lower the affective filter. Yeah, that's a great word that we use in English language teaching, right? We should make sure that filter is lower so students are, are okay with uh, communicating and, and using a new language because basically that's what we're doing in English. Um, yeah, keeping things clear and organized oh, with an agenda. I think that's helpful too, because some students really, or just some people in general, they really like to see things. And so if you have an agenda written down and that helps students know what's coming next, um, give them a hug. Oh, that's nice. And smiling. I see smiling a lot in these comments. Students should smile. These are great, great ideas. All right, Dan, over to you. Well, thanks again, Lottie. And again, wow, what a wealth of tremendously practical, beneficial, worthwhile ideas. I cannot thank you enough, those of you that are in attendance. All right. So we know that some students who experience trauma, it goes internally and they become depressed and they become anxious. But that's not the only way that students can respond. By the way, I bet you know this, but these are not switches. Some people become depressed, but they never become anxious. There's a blend of all of these things that occur within all of us when we experience difficulty. And there might be some days when we express that difficulty with depression, but there might be other days we express that trauma with item number two, suspicion and negativity. In our first example, students take the trauma and they internalize it. In our second example, they take the trauma and it obscures their view of the world around them. They don't bring it in, but it prevents them from seeing the world in any other way but suspicion and negativity. By the way, again, you can recognize this quickly in the classroom. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. It's a beautiful day. Everyone is happy, but one student says, you know, I see some clouds. It's probably going to rain later. Oh, I heard on the radio the temperature is going to fall. They go through life because they've experienced trauma, 
now they want to expect trauma because you know what? When we lower our expectations, we're never disappointed. And so they're constantly looking at the world and saying, yeah, it's bad. This way their heart will never be broken again. You know, if we don't intervene and help these students recover, that's a terrible way to live one's life. If teachers don't get in the gap with this psychological need, partnering with parents, of course, partnering with, with psychology professionals, of course, but if, if teachers don't do their part, once we get locked in this spiral of suspicion and negativity, it is so hard to escape. Will you do your part? Friends, I'm gonna ask you uh, to do one thing. When you're working with that student that is suspicious, when you're working with that student that is negative, I'm gonna go back to our foundation, so I won't spend much time with this, but the experts tell us that if you want to escape negativity, then you've got to be in an environment where trust is highly evident. The student that is negative has got to start believing in something again. The student that is negative has got to know that maybe the whole world is messed up, but this classroom, this one classroom, there is a rainbow of hope where good things can occur. Look, my wonderful friends, I know you can't change what happens outside the walls of your school. That's outside your scope. But wow, you can create a positive, warm, engaging, friendly, consistent, trust-filled environment in your classroom. Well, I just want to ask you, just as we always do, I'd love to hear these ideas a lot either. So amazing. But what is it that you have done to take a negative student and help him be positive again? What have you done to take that doubting, suspicious student and help him not to be so suspicious in the future? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So how do you how do you change students' point of view? So students who have negative outlooks, how do you change it so that they have a more positive outlook? So how have you rebuilt trust and positivity with your negative or suspicious students? So what have you done? Maybe things that you have said or ways that you have acted or maybe things that you've said as an example. Um, I see in the chat box, trying to be their mentor, students' mentors. Mm -hmm. Oh, and finding out, I like this, getting to the root of the problem. That's something we say, trying to figure out what exactly is, is causing them to feel upset and then um, bringing light into their darkness. That's a very nice way to put it. Giving them motivational talks. I think that's nice to telling them that they're not alone, that there are other people who have these, uh, these similar experiences or these similar feelings at least. Um, I, uh, Maria says, I, I get them to open up to me about a hobby or something they love to do. So maybe something outside of school. Uh, Sam says to level with them. So level with them means you try to get on their same, their same level, right? You talk to them as a, not so much as a teacher to a student, but almost as a peer. Um, so talk to them in a, in a friendly, informal way. Um, yeah, someone says here on the Zoom chat that every problem has a solution. Um, or at least, you know, it's not the end of the world. There are solutions, there are options, there are ways to move forward. Um, validate their feelings. That's important to say that it's okay to feel this way. It's okay to feel negative. Um, and then just listen carefully and not diminish the feeling. I think that's very, very important because these are real feelings that students have. Um, yeah, these are great, great ideas, Dan. I couldn't possibly agree more. What wonderful. Again, I'm going to go back. I'm going to steal all your ideas and write another book. This is a really outstanding. Uh, great, great job, those of you that are in attendance. All right, friends, we've said that trauma affects everybody differently. Some people take it in with uh, depression and with anxiety. Some people, it obscures their view of the world. The world suddenly becomes a terrible place and they're negative and suspicious. The last group of students they've been hurt and they want to hurt others. The last group of students hurting people hurt people. It's always very, very true. So instead of bringing it in, they lash outward. The third kind of trauma individualized impact is hyperactivity and aggression. Now, I just wanna say parenthetically that when we talk about hyperactivity, we all know that there is hyperactivity that occurs that has nothing to do with trauma. It is an inborn trait that students have. But there are students that become hyperactive because of the trauma in their lives. 
we know that some students believe, maybe not consciously, but somewhere in their minds, that if I keep swirling, if I keep spinning, if I keep moving, if I keep active, I never have to stop and slow down to think about the trauma of my life. Because I know that if I slow down and I pause and I close my eyes and I think, I'm only going to think difficult, challenging, harmful thoughts. It's really sad, isn't it? You have students in your classroom right now that are masking trauma with hyperactivity. You have another set of students, though, that have become deeply, deeply angry. They've been hurt so much that they desperately have, want to express that pain by causing pain for other people. They become aggressive. Sadly, that sometimes is verbal, but sometimes it becomes physically aggressive as well. They lash out in their desire to hurt others so other people can feel the pain that they feel so deep inside. You know, there's two things that the experts tell us. Well, there's a hundred things they tell us, but just two to get us started today. First of all, so many times we'll see a hyperactive student or an aggressive student, and let's be honest, their presence in our classrooms can be frustrating. Their presence in our classrooms can be irritating. Their presence in our cl classrooms can be difficult. And so we respond the way a human being would respond. We become angry at them. We start to reject them instead of rejecting their behavior. Dear friends, I just remind you, and I know that you know it because you're an educator, the first rule of education is compassion. Caring more about your students than you care about yourself. Putting their needs first and foremost in your thinking. Putting their needs above your own preferences. When I say compassion as a teacher, that's exactly what I'm talking about. When you have that child that's swirling around negative and aggressive, you should be thinking about them the way you think about their spelling. You don't punish them for misspelling. You look for ways to teach them better. In this similar circumstance, yes, sometimes punishment is necessary, but do we apply our interventions in a way that it's about student growth and it's about student learning? Teachers are in the business of teaching. Teach them cognitively, yes, but teach them emotionally as well. Teach them behaviorally as well. Now, I will say this. Sometimes we just need a fence. Sometimes we just need guidance that we need to know that certain behaviors, no matter what we're feeling, certain behaviors are not acceptable. And so the experts say this, when dealing with the hyperactive and aggressive student of trauma, compassion with firmness. Lottie, I would love to hear some amazing new ideas from our peers about how they've managed hyperactivity in their own classrooms in a very practical and effective way. Yeah, that's a good question. So before we talked about working with students who are depressed or anxious, students who had a negative outlook on life. So now we're thinking about students who might respond to trauma by being aggressive or hyperactive. Um, so what is it that you can do in the classroom? Maybe things you've done in the past, or maybe these are ideas that you have of things that you can do as a teacher um, to help these students who act out. So that term act out means that they might, as Dan was giving examples, they might act more aggressive. Um, they, might, uh, they, they, they might not behave as you expect them to in a classroom. How can you continue to support those students? Um, oh, so I see a good comment here from Lehman who says learning English is not easy. Um, yeah, that's true. Learning a language is difficult. Um, and that's why while teaching, I use integration with to other students or to other subjects, excuse me, to other subjects and trying to listen to them. So that's a great point. So I think students, if they're interested in the topic, they might be less likely to, uh, to act out or to misbehave. So if you could somehow in your teaching of English, like integrate other topics, other content areas, um, I see Karen says that she reaches out to mental health resources in the school or the community. That's very important, I think, to think about like other, like other colleagues that you have who have expertise in helping students who have experienced trauma. So reach out to those, um, to those colleagues or to other resources in your community. 
Um, let's see, what else do we see? Uh, Oksana says that she arranges competitions for them. Oh, that's nice. Gives them um, to a competition. So it gives, makes students, uh, it, it moves their focus on something else, right? If they're in a competition, um, give class duty. So give them a job. Um, that is, yes, that's good, great. Give, uh, give students different tasks that are interesting to them. Yeah, I see this a lot in the comments that uh, trying to make sure the tasks are interesting for students. And I think that will help motivate them to actually learn or focus on the task. Um, yeah, and simply just reminding them that they need to respect each other, um, that they need to respect their classmates. Um, yes, this is great, great ideas. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Lottie, again, as always, that was uh, fantastic. Because of the time, we're going to move beyond a couple of slides and uh, try and get to this issue of resilience. Uh, friends, we're doing a fantastic job. I pat you all on the back. You're amazing. Congratulations. We laid that foundation perfectly. We talked about how trauma affects individual students individually. You did incredible with that. And now we're going to move to that topic that seemed to be perhaps the most popular. For about the last nine minutes, we'll talk about this issue of resilience. And I will say this, I wouldn't normally say this, but uh, come back to the next session in a couple of weeks and whatever we didn't cover today, we'll cover then. But let's go ahead and talk about resilience. Resilience is that idea that when we get knocked down, we just have to find it within ourselves to get back up. How do we do that? Well, the research, by the way, I've done a lot of research in this area, and I've got to tell you, the research is all the same. It's not always true in educational research that you get the same answer in different ways 500 times, but this issue of resilience, the same topics keep coming up again and again and again. I'm absolutely convinced that they are accurate. Now, the first one, wonderful friends, when we want to rebuild resilience in students, the first one, I think, is very counterintuitive. When someone falls down, we want to try and make things easier for them because we think that is what they need. But the research tells us this, that the best way to grow resilience in a student, the best way to help them recover from difficulties, traumatic problems of their past, is to help them set and then to achieve brave, brave goals. You know, when people are hurting, we try to put this blanket of protection around them. And I understand it completely. And I certainly don't fault you if you do it. But the research tells us that self-worth, self-value, the willingness to be resilient grows from accomplishing something meaningful. Now, I'm going to imagine that if you think about this, you're going to go, you know, he's right. If you think about it, you're going to think in your own life when you face tremendous difficulty, and then you overcame that tremendous difficulty, you felt better about yourself in that moment than you ever felt before. When you were faced with an obstacle that seemed insurmountable, when you were faced with a problem that seemed unsolvable, and you worked through it, and you figured it out, you came out the other side knowing that you were a stronger person, knowing that you were a better person. What am I getting at here? Well, just a quick example for you, friends. Do you provide meaningful academic rigor in your classrooms? Now, I know what you're thinking, because I think the same thing. When they're hurting, we should make it easier. The research tells you exactly the opposite. When they're hurting, give them something challenging to fight through. And when they get through to the other side, they'll be healthier people with greater self-esteem and the trauma will have less impact on their lives. That's my best example for you. When you have students that need brave goals, what is it that you do to work through situations so that they won't quit, they won't give up? What are those teacher traits, those abilities, those skills that you possess that help your students pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and keep on moving? I, can't, I literally can't wait to hear your wonderful ideas. Yeah, that's a great question, Dan. So how do you encourage your students to work through tough content without quitting? 
So yeah, think about it. What is it that you can do to encourage them to keep going? I know it's tempting. I feel that same temptation. I think as a teacher, Dan, to, to shelter students and to, to make sure that they, they don't have too much hard work. But what is it that we can do to really challenge them and help them go, you know, work through the tough content? Um, oh, I see one person says, yeah, I tell them I believe in you. So simple, simple as that. Um, Oksana says in English lessons, she uses motivation speeches, motivational speeches of famous people. That's a great way to integrate English language learning. And also you have the motivation speak, the speeches, the content to help encourage students. Um, let's see, what else do we see? Um, yeah, I see more people saying like they smile and give hugs. So I think that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't uh, that doesn't go away, right? A smile goes a long way for for a lot of these different techniques. Um, inspirational quotes, that's great. And I like these things about inspirational quotes and reading speeches because again, we're English teachers, and so our goal is to help students learn English. So these are ways that they can practice to learn new vocabulary, but at the same time, hopefully, they're being inspired to continue on. Uh, giving positive encouragement, supporting, believing in students. Ah, Robert says, break it down into manageable steps so it's not overwhelming. That's a great tip, I think. If you have a really um, a challenging assignment and a student who feels overwhelmed with life in general plus school to kind of break it down, kind of what you were getting at earlier, Dan, like just focus on the next best step. Um, setting your own example of resilience. Um, I like that. And we talked a little bit about that too, like bringing your own personal life into the classroom and show examples of what you do or what you have done to overcome difficult situations. Um, yeah. Oh, and someone else mentions that, yeah, this is difficult in distance lessons. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's got to be, I think a lot of these, a lot of these techniques are seem easier. They seem, um, yeah, they seem like they would be easier to do in person when you can actually really hug a student or really smile and talk to a student. Um, so I think that's a that's a good thing to think about um, that we can continue learning about how can we uh, enact some of these strategies, you know, when teaching online. Um, okay, so Dan, back to you. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, looking at the clock, I, I think we want to be careful about concluding at the right moment. So I'm going to go ahead and put a bow on it today. And Alati, I know you need a minute at the end for an announcement. Uh, so I'm just going to say this. Uh, we didn't get through everything today. I really do hope you'll come back in two weeks. I hope that uh, and you'll bring your great examples with you when you come back in two weeks. And whatever we didn't cover today, we're going to try and figure out a way to weave in uh, to that topic as well to continue helping you with this popular issue of resilience. Friends, I can't teach without reviewing. Uh, and so let me just remind you what we tried to accomplish today. First of all, do you have the right foundation for trauma-informed instruction? Would you describe your classroom as a place of safety? Do you give your students choice in how they go about making decisions for your learning? Is your classroom a place filled with community and collaboration and mutual support? Once you have that strong, sturdy foundation built on relational trust, you're now ready to meet the individual needs of students. What do you do for those students who have depression and anxiety? Are you providing them with that perfect clarity they need to do just the next step? When you're working with students that are negative and suspicious, have you created a positive environment that is sunny and warm, shining a light as someone said, into their difficult darkness. And then finally, as you work with those students that are hyperactive and violent, are you aggressive? Are you very careful to be compassionate? Think of them as a person first, but then of course, providing them with the firmness that they need. We just started with the topic of resilience, but the first step, set those big goals. It's counterintuitive. You don't know if you believe it, but it's absolutely true according to the research. Ask them to do tough things so that they can rise up and realize how amazing they truly are. Friends, I can't thank you enough for the time that we've spent together. You have been astounding. I knew we were gonna get some good answers. I didn't know we would get a plethora, a myriad of amazing responses. I can't thank you enough for being a wonderful class. And with that, Lottie, I give it to you. Thank you, Dan, thanks. And thanks for a very informative webinar. And I wanna thank everyone who's joined us and our audience for your great participation and ideas too. I um, I learned a lot, I know, for sure, um, both from Dan and also from your ideas. Uh, we want to invite you to continue the conversation with us. So 
we are going to move to a different Zoom room. Um, this is optional, but we really encourage you if you're interested and would like to talk some more. Um, I will be there um, as well as my Relo colleagues and uh, Dan, Dr. Dan Shepard will be there to, um, to talk with you and just to hear about your experiences and learn more from you. Um, so we have this in the, the link, the new Zoom room in the, in the link in the chat. So you'll have to copy and paste that link and type it into your browser. So it won't be this room, it's a different room. Um, so with that, I hope to see everyone in the Zoom room. If I don't see you in the Zoom room, please come back uh, two weeks from now and we will have another um, webinar with Dr. Shepard where we'll learn more. We'll kind of expand on some of the topics that we talked about today. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see you in the new Zoom room. Goodbye. <laughs>